Eternal Father of mercy and compassion, may your grace and your power lead us, we plead with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings, my brothers and sisters, colleagues and friends all over the world. May the Lord truly bless you. This is the Herald Report Ministry. My name is Kudza, your host. To those who are joining us for the first time, may the Lord truly bless you. To those who have been with us before, may the Lord still truly bless you. And today we are looking at God's final option for the remnant church. God's final option for the remnant church. God will do whatever it takes to save humanity. But there is a time that God cannot do anything if humanity refuse to be saved he cannot do anything but god has a plan a to save humanity but humanity if humanity is not obedient if humanity does not want to listen then god employs the plan b so now this is the plan b for the church of god i want you to follow this clearly brothers and sisters because we're in the book of daniel chapter 1 from verse 1 in the third year of the reign of joachim king of judah came Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Joachim king of Judah unto the hand, to his hand and part of the vessel of the, of the house of God which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God and he brought the vessels unto the treasure house of his God. So the Bible is clear that God in his mess and love he decided to hand over Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. The question is why did God do such a thing that he will hand over his people to the oppressor? He will hand over his people to somebody like Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, brother and sister, Israel was a church of God. And how can God harshly treat his church? What was the problem with the church of God? Brothers and sisters, there is a serious challenge that we see in the church of God. Right from the beginning, we start with Israel and we go all the way until the door of mess shall be closed. The church of God has a problem and it is a serious problem. But the fact, which is the fact that we need to all to understand that it is the church of God and God has a way of dealing with it so that the church of God can come to terms. Not only that, the church of God can return to God and he will abundantly pardon. So when you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36 from verse 15, the Bible says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by mess his messengers, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Now, God had compassion on his people, number one. He had also compassion on his dwelling place. To prove his compassion, he decided to send messengers. He decided to send pro them prophets so that they can return to him. Remember Isaiah chapter 59, God cannot see eye to eye with sin and it is our sin that has separated us from God and in everything, God's desire is that we may return to him so he send messengers to us so that there could be a revival among his people but what happened verse 16 but they mocked the messengers of god and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of god the wrath of the lord arose against his people till there was no remedy so everything was done until there was no remedy for the children of Israel. Because there was no remedy, God had to do something which was very difficult. He decided then to send them to exile. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, God will do everything for his church until there is no remedy. But now in this phase that we are in, the remedy for the church of God will be to shake the church of God. And when the church is fully shaken and grain has been separated from the uh, from, from, from dross, gold has been separated from dross in the church, then Jesus Christ will come. So in this juncture or during this time, we are in the process of sh shaking. And this is the process of separation where everything Thing that can be shaken will be shaken. Verse 20, Jeremiah 25, verse 4, the Bible says, And the Lord has sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, Turn ye again now, 
every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord has given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. But what did they do? Instead, they rejected the message of God. They stoned them. They, cru they destroyed. They killed the prophets without mercy. Verse 6, and go not after other gods to save them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands and I will not, I will do you no hurt. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, says the Lord, that you might prove, provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore thus says the Lord, behold, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, what am I going to do? Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of uh, Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all the nations around about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. Before the destruction by Nebuchadnezzar, God warned them, when you study the books written by Moses in Leviticus chapter 26, 21, God warned them a disaster will come. He warned them he will bring plagues. He warned them he will do all kinds. He will chastise them seven times for their sins. They knew all this. Not only that, he actually told them that a sword was going to come to them if they continue in the wrong way. I want to go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 64. God pronounced the blessing and he pronounced the curses. And in the curses, verse 64 says, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt save other gods, which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. Did they know about this warning? Yes, they did. They had an understanding. Did they believe it? Maybe not. But everything that God did, he warned the Israelites that if you don't repent, if you continue in sin, if you continue in rebellion, if you continue worshipping idols, all these things are going to happen to you. Indeed, to exile you shall go. You know, when Solomon was dedicating the sanctuary, he even prayed that in case they rebel against thee and you send them far away so that they are now in bondage, when they pray facing this place, please hear them. So now the Israelites were to go in bondage. So what happened? God himself handed them over. Because remember, when God is protecting you, nothing can happen to you. Remember the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivers them. So nothing can touch you as a child of God. But God removed his protection and he allowed the ferocious Nebuchadnezzar to pounce on them. We are told in Prophets and Kings, God had pleaded with Judah not to provoke him to anger, but they had hearkened not. So they provoked God to anger, and he was left without an option. Finally, sentence was pronounced against them. They were to be led kept away captive to Babylon. The Chaldeans were to be used as an instrument by which God would chastise his obedient people. His disobedient people. So the coming of the Chaldeans, it was for the benefit of Israel. This was a plan B. As they are being chastised, as they are suffering, that maybe they may look to God. This was the best way to help them with the language they could understand. It says, the suffering of the men of Judah were to be in proportion to the light they had and to the warnings they had despised and rejected. Long had God delayed his judgments, but now he would visit his displeasure upon them as a last effort to check them in their evil course. The last effort to check them in their evil course. The last effort to appeal, maybe they may repent. He had to cause problems to come. Brothers and sisters, what we see in church today this is what God is allowing to happen. Remember the instruments of shaking. The first one is a straight testimony. When we reject straight testimony, he allowed delusions to come. 
And today we are in a serious challenge with delusions. It is simply because we are in a process of shaking and God is separating wheat and tears. And the best way to do that for God is to allow false theories to come. And as this comes, when persecution comes, it separates us completely. Those of God who stand on the side of God and those of the devil who stand on the side of the devil. And this is the best way how God was separating his children. And this is what happened even in Babylon. You remember that uh, when you study the book of Daniel, you realize that when you come to Daniel chapter 3, you see the true servants of God. You come to Daniel chapter 6, you see the true servant of God. But many of them, they disappeared. And this is exactly what is happening in these last days. We are told that within a few short years, the king of Babylon was to be used as an instrument of God's wrath upon impenitent Judah. Again and again, Jerusalem was to be invested vested and ended by the besieging armies of Nebuchadnezzar, company after company. At first, a few only, but later on, thousands and tens of thousands were to be taken captive to the land of Shina, there to dwell in forced exile and worship the foreign gods. Israel could not understand God in good times. God had to use a different plan. Now the question is, can God still employ the same plan to his church today? God will create a situation where his people may be able to listen to him. Chapter 35, 17 of Jeremiah says, Therefore thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord God, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heed, and I have called unto them, but they have not answered. So now to draw their attention, evil had to come. Protection was removed. They found themselves in exile under the leadership of Nebuchadnezzar. But as they were going to exile, God had a plan for them because it was for their benefit. But not only that, they were to go to exile as messengers of God. Isaiah chapter 43 from verse 10, the Bible says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither was there be after me. Even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no, no Savior. I have declared and have saved and I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore you are my witnesses, say the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work and shall let it. So they were going to Babylon as people who had an understanding of the true God to go and live among the nation who don't have an understanding of the true God, so that when they are among them, this nation who do not have an understanding of the true God, who know what it means to save the true God, who know which, who, who, who this true God is, and then this nation may also get the benefits of having an understanding and worshipping the true God by their witnesses, witnessing in a difficult situation, verse 14, that says the Lord for your, redeem, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon. So it was for, your, for their sake. Why was it for their sake? Because in good times, in comfortable times, they could not hear the word of God. In comfortable times, they could not take God at his word. Therefore, he removed all the protection. He removed all the benefits. And in pain and sorrow, they were to look for God. You know, brothers and sisters, we need to understand that uh, God blessed the remnant of Judah in Babylon. And the reason why he blessed them, so that they can be his witnesses. Before that, he blessed them in Judah. But in those blessings, they failed to give glory to the, to the giver. Instead, they glorified in the gifts. Therefore, he removed them 
and he put them in a place which was so difficult. But in that difficult place, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, For I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me, when you shall search for me with all your heart. In the comfortable time of Judah, they could not see God with all their hearts. But now for 70 years they were to be in Babylon. But in those 70 years, God said to them, Listen, I've put you in this situation, but I still love you. I still have plans for you to give you an expected end. Therefore, cooperate with me in this situation. So they find themselves in Babylon. The plan of God is to send them, to save them. But the plan of the devil is to ensure that the God of heaven cannot be worshipped at all. So the plan of the devil was to ensure that he destroys any trace of God in his children. But God has made a provision and he has done everything to ensure that in this difficult time, in this difficult situation, his people may have an understanding of the true God is. So verse 3 of Daniel chapter 1 says, And the king spake unto Eshpanaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princess. Now these were very special people of the lineage of Hezekiah. They were to be a very special people. After being educated, they will be ambassadors, they will be governors, they will be representatives of the kingdom of Babylon in Judah. Do you know the most challenging and painful thing, brothers and sisters, is that, you know, the devil educates his people and he sent them into the church of God, that they can represent him in the church of God and do his bidding in the church of God and take orders from him outside the church of God and they will come and implement those in the church of God. This is what Nebuchadnezzar was planning and this is exactly how the government of the devil work. He works by infiltration. That's why brothers and sisters, um, uh, Jude verse 4 says, we need to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints because they had their men who have crept in among us ordained for this condemnation, ungodly men, these have been planted by the devil. And this has been the plan of Nebuchadnezzar to ensure that after these young boys are killed, they will go and repre represent us in Judah. And then we maintain the colony. Verse, uh, verse 4, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end of three thereof they might stand before the king now among these were of the children of Judah, Hanan, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Hazariah. So they were chosen and given this special favor that they may also be educated. They may be enrolled in the best universities. They may be given the best food of Babylon. They may be treated as royals. They may get all the necessary favors. While this was happening, there was a plan hidden for the devil. Now, by the devil. Now, verse 7 says, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for, the, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. So the names were changed so that they cannot remember their true God. The plan was well calculated to ensure that their culture would change, that they would denounce their God. Everything that reminds them of who the true God was was removed, and as that was happening, the hope was that eventually these children would change gradually. You know, my brothers and sisters, it is the same skill of the devil to ensure that if he wants to change your character, he don't tell you how to change your character. He changes the environment. And remember, it says by beholding we become changed. The environment has been changed to ensure that everything is associated with the devil 
as everything is associated with the devil sooner or later when you familiarize in that environment and you stay stay in that environment so much you may discover that you may become like that environment you will not see the evilness of evil anymore because you just continue to behold the evil Inspiration, Prophets and Kings, page 481, said the king did not compel the Hebrew youth to renounce their faith in favor of idolatry. But he hoped to bring this about gradually by giving them names significant to idolatry, by bringing them daily into close association with idolatrous customs, and under the influence of the seductive rites of heathen worship, he hoped to induce them to renounce their religion of their, the religion of their nation and unite with the worship of the Babylonians. The devil has done that in the church today, is it? The music is cooked in Babylon. The preacher is taken notes from Babylon. The dressing is that of Babylon. The food that we eat is that of Babylon. Everything has been prepared in a way that it will lower the standard of God and compromise it with the devil, mingle with evil. And then we cease to understand the truth of God. We cease to see the peculiarity of the things of God. It is the same plan that is employed today. So when these Hebrew boys understood that this was planned we understand that on verse 8 but daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of king's meat nor with the wine which he drank therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself now god had brought daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs what's so special about food while you make while will he make a decision not not to eat that which was from the king was this not special? Is it, can food do anything to me? Does food affect my salvation? Brothers and sisters, if food does not affect our salvation, that no, then we have nothing to worry. But food is a very, very challenging thing. It can affect our salvation greatly. Remember, the devil tempts us via appetite and passion. And therefore, because this is an instrument which the devil uses, how we eat, when we eat, the kind of food we eat, the quality of food we eat is very critical, even for our salvation. We are told in, the, in Conflict and Courage, page 246, paragraph 4, Daniel and his companions in Babylon were, in their youth, apparently more favored for fortune, or fortune than was Joseph in the early years of his life in Egypt, yet they were subjected to test of characters scarcely less severe. From the comparative simplicity of the, their Judean home, these youth of royal line were transported to the most magnificent of cities, to the court of its greatest monarch, and were singled out to be trained for the king's special service. Singled out to be trained for a special service. But in that situation, we are told that strong were the temptation surrounding them in the corrupt and luxurious court. The direction that their foods should be supplied from the royal table was an expression both of the king's favor and of his solitude for their welfare. But a portion Having been offered to idols, the food from the king's table was consecrated to idolatry and in partaking of the king's bounty, this youth would be regarded as uniting in his homage to false gods. As they understood that, they purposed that this we cannot do because we are from the royal family, because we are representing God. This we cannot do. Brothers and sisters, are we able to make that kind of decision? These things we cannot participate in because we are the children of God. These things we cannot do because we belong to God. Brothers and sisters, God expects us to make a decision when we come to a situation, to stand by him. We are told that here Daniel was brought to a, a severe test. Should he adhere to the teachings of his fathers concerning meats and drinks and offend the king? And probably lose not only his position but his life or, 
or should he disregard the commandments of the Lord and return the favor of the king, thus securing great intellectual advantages and the most flattering worldly prospects? Everything was before him, and he was to make a choice. And today, brothers and sisters, we make a choice every day. Are we going to stand with God? Are we going to stand with the devil? Are we going to be true to principle? Are we going to compromise? We are told that Daniel did not hesitate. He decided to stand firm in his integrity. Let the results be what it, it might. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's midst. Therefore, he decided to stand on the principles. Brothers and sisters, how we eat, as I've said, when we eat, the kind of food we eat is very critical for our salvation. Remember, we cannot receive the letter rain without health reform. And if we don't receive the letter rain, we are not able to go through the time of trouble. Neither can we give the loud cry message. Therefore, it means that we will not spiritually mature. For that reason, we cannot be saved. And remember, the two avenues, as I've mentioned before, which the devil used, is appetite and passion. Unless we can overcome on these two things, we will not be able to overcome every other temptation. Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene, page 8, says, Every true Christian will have control of his appetites and passion. Can I say I've eaten enough? Can I say this I cannot eat? Do I need to eat to please people? Or do I need to eat to the glorification of God? Am I eating because the food has been prepared? Am I eating because it's time for eating and we're hungry? It says, unless he is free from the bondage of appetite, he cannot be a true obedient servant of Christ. Nobody will be saved without being freed from the bondage of appetite and passion. For we cannot be true servants of God. The indulgence of appetite and passion blunts the effect of truth upon the heart. That's why those guys who don't like temperance, they fight so much in the church. Their minds have been blunted. When we indulge in appetite and passion, we cannot understand the word of God very well. The indulgence of appetite and passion blunts the effect of truth upon the heart. And it is impossible for the spirit and power of the truth to sanctify man's soul and body and spirit when it is controlled by sensual desires. So if uh, your mind has been blunted, you can't hear, you can't understand. Therefore, you may not be sanct you cannot be sanctified. We are told that the controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when if they had conquered on this point, they would have had moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. In Daniel chapter 1, this was the first temptation. And the Bible is very clear that the Hebrew boys overcome. There was something which was very special about those, these Hebrew boys. They treasured the word of God in their hearts. When you study the book of Psalms chapter 119 from verse 9, the Bible says, Wherewith thou shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed there unto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, all let me know to wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. As they grew up, these young people, they were trained in the word of God to value God more than anything else. The word of God was written in their hearts. They were prepared for difficult situation. For the word that can give them power to decide was in them. Our victory in every temptation, brothers and sisters, it's in it is written. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4, it is written. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10, it is written. Matthew chapter 4 verse 7, it is written. That's why we are to internalize the word of God as much as we can. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, the Bible says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt... Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way 
And when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as friendless between thine eyes. They were educated the Hebrew way. Brought up in the word of the Lord. They studied the Bible. They earnestly prayed. They were obedient to the word of God. And God empowered them in difficult situations. Brothers and sisters, our victory is in cooperation with God. We get an understanding of the will of God from his Bible. And by prayer we respond to him. And the spirit of the Lord come upon us. And we'll be able to live a Christ-like life. And because of their humility, because of their obedience, chapter 1 of Daniel, they are successful. Chapter 2 of Daniel, they are successful. Chapter 3 of Daniel, they are successful. When we come to chapter 6 of Daniel, Daniel is still prevailing. Brothers and sisters, it is all because of their obedience. And the question today is, do we still have people who are obedient? Do we still take God as it at his word? Even in difficult situations where our Christianity is sifted, can we still remain loyal? Remember, education, page 57, say the greatest wand of the world is a wand of men, men who will not be bought nor sold, men who in their innermost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its rightful name, men whose conscience is as true to duty as a needle to the poor, men who stand for the right though the heavens fall. But this doesn't just come, brothers and sisters. There is something that you have to do so that when your character is tested, your manhood will sin. We are told that, but such a character is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favors or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self to the service of love to God and man. It, no, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't come by accident, by obedience, by training. So as Daniel made a decision that he's not going to defile himself with the king Smith, the Bible is very clear from Daniel chapter 1 verse 9 that God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed you meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melza, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, uh, Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our, let our continences be looked upon before thee and the continents of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and thou, seal, thou as thou seest, deal with thy servants. You know, my brothers and sisters, you just need 10 days of eating healthy to reverse some diseases. You just need 10 days of abiding by a healthy lifestyle to see a transformation in your life. As it is written in Daniel chapter 1, so it is practically. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. What had happened? As God promised, so he will fulfill. God promised that there is a great blessing in being temperate. There is a great blessing in living healthy. Health is not by chance, but is a choice that we make. So that smells up took away the portion of their, their, their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for th these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Not only that, he continued during the time of Nebuchadnezzar all the way until in Persia. What was happening, it was because of their 
dedication. Brothers and sisters, in exile, the children of Israel were promoted because of their obedience. They went in there because of the rebellion of their fathers. But while they were there, they were witnesses. Their characters were revealed, were, were revealed because of the persecution. They were tried and nothing was seen which was evil. And we are told that uh, the king promoted them and he gave them positions in the government. And life was actually much better. Verse 20 says, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his king realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. When God blesses us, he will bless us indeed. You don't need to copy notes from the heathens. By depending on God, we can excel. The question is, are there some of us today who still depend on God? Does God still have a people? When God has left, is left without a choice, he put us in, in a situation where our characters are tried. When our characters are being tried, can we remain loyal to God as the four Hebrew boys? May the Lord bless us and help us to take his word seriously, even in good times to remain loyal and in difficult times never to deviate from the truth that we have received. Shall we pray? Eternal Father of mercy and compassion, when your church rebelled, you put them in the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. In that difficult situation, your true servants were seen. They remained loyal. In the difficulties that we may be facing, Lord, give us grace and power to remain loyal to the truth. Bless us, we plead with you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you, my brothers and sisters. I look forward to see you in the next edition very soon as we begin the series in the book of the Great Controversy. It will take us time by God's grace and we'll do it slowly as the Spirit of the Lord leads us. Continue to be blessed in the Lord. Continue to be strong in the Lord. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share the link of the Herald Report Ministry. Until then, my brothers and sisters, God bless.